This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we talk about what happened last night here in New York City, actually, technically, it was in Brooklyn, where a political event hosted by Ilana Glazer of Comedy Central's Broad City at the Union Temple Synagogue in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, was canceled. It was last night Ilana canceled it after anti-Semitic and racist messages were found scrawled on walls throughout the building. Among the messages were, Jew better be ready, insert oven here, end is now, the word Hitler, another graffiti said, free smoke for N-word Jews, but it wrote out the epithet. And another said F-P-E-E-P-R, um, and it had a kind of Puerto Rican flag. These were all magic markered. The graffiti comes amidst a surge in anti-Semitic hate crimes nationwide, including Saturday's massacre of 11 Jewish worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. So I was scheduled to speak with uh, Ilana at the event. It was an unusual, well, shifting of the microphone. She was going to be interviewing me about the coverage of midterm elections and what it means to cover grassroots groups. So, as I was coming to the synagogue, Alana called me and she said, this may have to be canceled. We have a situation. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, and then we saw the graffiti. Uh, and floor after floor, whether it was near the all-gender bathroom or in the stairwells that we were walking, we walked past the rabbi's study. Uh, you know, we saw the sign that said, I cert, insert oven here. Um, and it got more and more serious. And so, as hundreds of people gathered for the event, there's a synagogue there, there's all sorts of event rooms. Um, Ilana made the decision to cancel the event, not wanting to put anyone in jeopardy. Um, Ilana made the announcement to the hundreds of people that were there. Hey, y'all. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, we have a situation that we will, that's not presenting any immediate danger, but um, there were uh, hateful anti-Semitic scrawled all over the space today. Um, very recently, within the past couple hours, um, so we don't feel safe. This wasn't the event, you know what I mean? This is, um, but we are experiencing this together, and this is something for us to think about, gather around, organize, and activate, and um, we'll follow up with the story and um, who I was hoping to show you guys, these local candidates who are running tight races who need your help uh, canvassing this weekend. So that's Alana Glazer canceling the event last night. No, there were no jokes there. You know, what certainly Alana is known for is her amazing humor. Um, we're going to continue our conversation now with Alana Glazer um, in part two of this conversation. She is co creator and star of the hit Comedy Central show Broad City. I really appreciate you coming in because this was a long night. And, you know, when we went outside and people were leaving, they were stunned after you made the announcement, trying to understand to take this all in. People were crying, they were hugging each other. Mm. Um, we're revealing here for the first time exactly what was said uh, on the walls, and we didn't get everything. There were other things as mm -hmm. well that were said. Um, uh, I wouldn't say the police were moving with great speed, but there were a number of them there. We could not understand actually what they were doing for hours. I talked to them way later into the night and saying, could you please explain why you would explain nothing and why you wouldn't help us uh, in any way figure out what was going on? Yeah, that was a bizarre dynamic that we were telling the cops what to do. They, they uh, and I, I, well, I was going to say I get it, but I don't quite get it. I, I don't really know what their job is. I, th I thought it was to protect and inform, um, and it was. They seemed like not sure what angle they were taking but you or were, something. You were quite sure. And yeah, and our group knew exactly what to do because we we had to take care of these people. They were all gathering, and it was like, oh, I had this like nightmare image in my head as these people are gathering. I'm like, just get them out slowly and calmly. Um, it was really. Uh, I really saw last night. We really experienced last night how. Um, 
our politics, how human rights politics are silenced by white supremacy, even if in threat. And like, you know, it was just hard to tell how, how to feel for so long. I'm still processing it where um, no one was killed. So I'm, I can like, you know, my body language, I can be relaxed, but someone could have been killed yesterday. I mean, just a week ago, there was this mass shooting, but it, it, it really, um, it feels so directly incited by the hateful rhetoric that's constantly coming out of the president's mouth. I mean, day in and day out, it's, it is like this abuse. Right. Whoever did this, we have, we don't know who did this. The police haven't found the person, but whoever they are, this country being pummeled with hate speech. Constantly pummeled. I mean, it really feels like this ab abusive partner or, or parent or something that, you know, hasn't been this abusive, like, ever before. I know the country, this country is built on white supremacy and was born out of white supremacy, but this abuse that we're feeling, and we talked about it in the, in Generator this week, that it's... And again, <laughs> explain what Generator is. So Generator is an online movement that encourages people to use Instagram to talk about policy. Yes, bikini pics, yes, vacation pics, but also let's give, let's drop one out of 10 videos to talk about how policy or government affects our everyday lives. Let's, you know, we got to this point, this divisive point in our country because growing up in the 90s, don't talk about politics. That was the thing. And we haven't talked about it long enough that here we are and it's it's zero or 100. Um, so these, these, uh, in th these live events, I interview politicians and activists and um, to see how they both work for the people also while getting uh, generator videos from the audience because it's you need community kind of support to speak up like this. Um, and yeah, it was just uh, we experienced last night. We couldn't have this event, but we experienced both the first night when I I called the opponent for, of Perry Gershon on Long Island. I called his opponent a white supremacist. He had to pull out for political reasons. And so then, the Democrat had to pull out. Yeah, because, because I called, called his Republican, Republican white supremacist. Yeah, because his um, his policies align with white supremacy. And it's the district that I grew up in. If I still live there, that would be my my representative. That's my parents' representative. It makes me so mad that this um, this person has these, this, and also as a Jew, it makes me mad that the, this Jewish person has these policies. Um, but Perry Gershon, the Long Island candidate, had to pull out. I, I, I get it. Jim Gorin on Long Island and Andrew Granardis of South Brooklyn, I was ready to send these canvassers, these willing and able bodies, send them to knock on doors for these politicians, and um, we couldn't get the message out last night because of um, racism and, and violence. I wanted to oh. turn, as you talk about um, white supremacy, to uh, Steve King. Um, he is the Iowa congressman. Uh, who is running? And, I mean, he was going to win by a landslide, except that now he's maybe a point ahead. The head of the National Republican Congressional Committee, uh, Congressman Steve Stivers, blasted Congressman Steve King on Twitter earlier this week, saying, Congressman Steve King's recent comments, actions, and retweets are completely inappropriate. We must stand up against white supremacy and hate in all forms, and I strongly condemn this behavior. Again, that tweet coming from one of the chief Republican fundraisers, um, it came as corporate supporters of King, including Intel, Land O'Lakes, and Purina Pet Care, said they would no longer fund King's campaigns. Um, just to talk about King's record, King recently endorsed far-right Canadian Faith Goldie for Toronto mayor, um, uh, who is an outright white supremacist, a proud one, and has amplified racist and anti-immigrant and posts on social media, including publishing a racist tweet in support of far-right Dutch politician Geert Wilders last year. Last week, it was reported King met with a neo-Nazi Austrian group during an August trip that was funded by a Holocaust memorial nonprofit. Now, so he went, he visited Holocaust sites, then he met with this neo-Nazi group. King later told The Washington Post, if they were in America pushing the platform that they push, they would be Republicans. That's what Steve King told The Washington Post about the neo-Nazis in Austria, that if they were here in the U.S., they would be Republicans. So until last year, Congressman King displayed a Confederate battle flag on his desk in his Capitol Hill 
office. Um, so then we go to yesterday. While Lana Glazer was canceling an event because of racist anti-Semitic graffiti in Brooklyn, um, Congressman Steve King in Iowa lashed out at a college student at a campaign event in Des Moines for asking about how King's personal beliefs line up with those of the Pittsburgh shooter, Robert Bowers. Let's go to that clip. You and the shooter both share an ideology that is fundamentally no, anti-immigration. Do not associate me with that shooter. I knew you were an ambusher when you walked in the room, but there's no basis for that, and you get no questions, was, you get I, no answers. I was about to ask no, you what done. distinguishes your ideology. We don't play these games here, I. I was about to ask no, you what distinguishes you're your ideology. Cross the line. It's not tolerable to accuse me to be associated with a guy that shot 11 people in Pittsburgh. I am a person who if has stood with Israel from the beginning, and to the length of that nation is the length of my life. So that's Steve King lashing out at the college student in Des Moines for asking about how his rhetoric is different from what Bowers said before wow. he opened fire on the Jewish worshipers, killing 11 of them. Alana. That is bold. And also his response is so clearly flustered. And, you know, there's this, like, bizarre dis, um, distinction now between—or or not distinction. It's, like, amorphous words into actions and the, the chaos that Trump specifically is causing and, and the GOP is specifically causing. I'm so shocked, actually, that the NRCC guy, the head of the Republican whatever— It's diverse, yeah. —is said that. Um, that's actually—that's a great— He's calling out his white supremacy. I'm, I'm shocked and, like, pleased. But um, I think that— um, Republican candidates around the country are feeling very threatened by their colleagues' white supremacy, and it's not only King. They they're should. Fi they're finding they have to separate themselves. Interestingly, in both Nevada with Heller and McSally in Arizona, they've told Trump not to come. He's, you know, wow. barnstorming the country. They don't want him in those two states wow. uh, as they attempt to take their Senate seats. I'm, like, holding my fingers, these, like, thoughts. One is that, like, you know, on the—in the car on the way here, like, I was just thinking, like, Trump's only platform is white supremacy. He doesn't know law. He doesn't know how the Constitution works. He's talking about changing the 14th Amendment. And even Paul Ryan is like, uh, I heard on Dem Democracy Now!, Paul Ryan's like, yeah, I, I can't support that. You know, it's like, it's so funny to be, to hear Trump, like, divide his own party. But he's not even a Republican. He's kind of just He's this this symbol. He's this symbol for white supremacy, which he's been since the 80s, you know, taking an ad out on the Central Park Five to uh, execute these young black boys. I mean, he's been he's been a racist. He's been out about it. And that's his only platform. There's no law. There's no constitution. There's no policy there. There's no experience for that to be only the experience of corrupt business to for his platform to be built on. And I'm so I'm so happy to see Republicans. I miss, a, like, a Republican, you know, McCain, you know, like a, a conversation that can happen um, that isn't just either hateful or, you know, human rights politics or white supremacist politics. It's, it's, it's more nuanced than that. And, and our country is not being honored um, with this chaos, this purposeful chaos. It's being abused with this chaos. So talk about how you chose to change your platform. You're usually a stand-up comic, or you're doing Broad City on TV, on Comedy Central. Then we're moving into the midterm elections, and you decide you want to do something different. Alana Glazer. So, okay, so I've been working on Generator for a couple years now, and Generator is this—can I repeat myself about this? So Generator is this um, online movement to— um, to uh, encourage people to use Instagram to talk about how government affects their everyday lives in conjunction with their, like, cute pics, whatever, fine. But, you know, can we sew in talking about politics, make that normal, make that as normal as posting yourself at whatever? You know, people post, I voted, but talk about policy. How does— So even, make it cute. Yeah, make it cute and also just humanize, humanize policy. You know, I'm not a dreamer, but when I started seeing accounts of dreamers, you know, these kids who— I, I can imagine myself at eight years old being brought somewhere that I didn't choose that. I'm a kid. You know, that affects me as an American. That affects me that I feel abused, even though I'm not a dreamer, even though I'm not a first generation immigrant. I'm abused as an American because that's not what I stand for as an American. So, OK, so that's the online movement. But we've been doing these um, live events where I interview politicians and activists to see how they both serve the people. And they're supposed to hinge. You know, they're supposed to uh, swing on the same hinge. Um, but so often they don't. And for the midterms, there's become this uh, very clear, actionable 
um, energy, this clear uh, flow of energy where my audience is ready to do something November 3rd and 4th. And I was really planning on pointing them towards canvassing for these politicians uh, and white supremacy in the first of four events and the fourth of four events. Three candidates in local, tight local races um, lost that chance. And it wasn't so conscious, like, oh, the midterms are coming, I'm going to do this. It was just a continuation of the Generator series. But this uh, this second installment of our series has become really, um, it's, it's making it clear uh, what's going on right now, how divided we are, how our words become actionable. And um, generators uh, on, on both of those nights experienced a story together. Uh, we all experienced the effects of how white supremacy and hate speech and hate um, silences human rights politics. So talk about who you've had on this week on Generator. At, I mean, it was all at this Brooklyn synagogue, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, the— um, mass shooting at the synagogue the, in Pittsburgh the week earlier it was so freaky to enter the synagogue the next day on Sunday. Um, I understand, again, why Perry Gershon didn't, uh, couldn't come. But um, this week, so that night, I interviewed um, Jess McIntosh and Zerlina Maxwell, who do Signal Boost on Sirius. And then Tuesday was, like Tuesday, these candidates were, are so amazing. These, uh, these candidates in Pennsylvania, Summer Lee, Sarah Inamorato, and Elizabeth Fiedler, who won their primaries. That's where their race mainly lied. Also, by the way, in Generator, like, my role is I'm not I didn't learn this. I didn't grow up in D.C. Like, I remember getting to college and, like, kids from D.C. were so serious and knew how everything worked. And I had no idea. I knew how comedy worked. You know what I mean? Um, so... I'm I'm just like a proxy for a newbie for the for the audience. I, I don't know what's going on. So you also had Anna Maria Archila on it, didn't you? Oh my goodness, yes, I did. Anna Maria Archila. The third night was um, two Democracy Now uh, uh, guests, uh, Ari Berman and Anna Maria Archila, and then um, Susan Bysowitz in Connecticut, who's running a, a tight race for lieutenant governor. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it's been extremely enlightening and inspiring, and it's like the, the best thing to do in these days when the president is um, abusing our ears and minds. The best thing to do is gather and organize and act. And um, Well, just yeah. to let people remind people who Anna Maria Archila is of the Center for Popular Democracy, which she co-directs. Uh, she's that woman who put her foot in the elevator door, uh, challenging Senator Flake uh, when he was about to approve. I think the statement had just come out from his office that he was going to vote for the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. Um, uh. And she uh, and Maria Gallagher, another woman, ran after him. He went into an elevator. They put their foot in the door, and they said, we are sexual assault survivors. Aren't you telling us our experiences don't matter? And maybe we can even play a clip of what they said. Um, and she said, look at um, me. Look at me when I'm talking to you. That was the best part. You know, we celebrated that night. I mean, that was the first time that our audience stood up and everyone was, like, teary-eyed and emotional. We celebrated how this, this petite Latina woman, this woman of color, made, you know, okay, the, the vote passed. It turns out, you know, everybody— believed, I think, Dr. Dr. Ford, because it was just so obvious. Uh, it was so obvious, you know? Um, but it turned out that the Republicans didn't care. That's really what it is. Not that they didn't believe her, that they didn't care. And I, I don't care, you know, I, I'm going to, like, celebrate for a second that Anna Maria Archila made space and time for her body, for her voice, for Dr. Ford's voice and Dr. Ford's body, made, created the space and time a week that they— that they uh, waited to pass, inevitably pass the vote. So let's go to Anna Maria Archila <clears throat> at that elevator challenging Senator Flake. That's what you're telling all of these women. That's what you're telling me right now. Look at me when I'm talking to you. You're telling me that my assault doesn't matter, that what happened to me doesn't matter, and that you're going to let people who do these things into power. That's what you're telling me when you vote for him. Don't look away from me. Look at me and tell me that it doesn't matter what happened to me. That you let people like that go into the highest court of the land and tell everyone what they can do to their bodies. So that's Maria Gallagher. That was the second woman who, as Anna Maria spoke, um, you know, gained strength to make her point. And we're going to play that clip in a second. Um, but 
you were electrified by this moment when you first saw it? Yeah, like what I was saying um, in introducing her was that I was so physically ill that day. My own experience is coming up. My friend's experience is coming up. And, you know, just 30 years after Anita Hill, just to see the same room of white men with furrowed brows. And, you know, I'm not saying it's white men, but that's who's in there. You know what I mean? That's just who's in there. Um, in fact, there had never been a woman and the rep a woman Republican senator ever serving on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Let me go to Anna Maria herself. She spoke right before Maria shared that. Senator Flake, do you think that Fred Brett Kavanaugh is telling the truth? Thank you. Thank you. Do you think that he's able to hold the pain of this country and repair it? That is the work of justice. The way that justice works is you recognize harm, you take responsibility for it, and then you begin to repair it. You're allowing someone who is unwilling to take responsibility for his own actions, unwilling to hold the harm that he has done to one woman, actually three women, and, and, and repair it. You are allowing someone who is unwilling to take responsibility for his own actions to respond in the higher court of the country and to, and to have the role of repairing the harm that has been done in this country to many people. No, no, thank you. What do you think? Senator, do you care to respond? Do you want to talk to his staff? No, I want to talk to him. Don't talk to me. What do you think? I understand, but tell me I'm standing right here in front of you. What do you have? To, do you think that he's telling the truth? Thank you. Don't know. Do you think that he's telling the truth to the country? You. you have power when so many women are powerless. Thank you. Thank you. Can you not give them an answer? We have, our, we have our press available to talk you to you guys if you want. You don't have the courage to give them an answer? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. We had a response? Thank no, you can either an come in or out. out. Thank you. Saying thank you is not an answer. Okay, this is about go. the future of our country, sir. So that was Anna Maria Archila of the Center for Popular Democracy and Maria Gallagher. Confronting Senator Flake, our guest is Alana Glazer, comedian, writer, and actress, co-creator and star of the comedy Central Show, Broad City. So, Amy, you asked me, like, about the pivot right now from comedy. You know, I just finished uh, filming Broad City, our final season, and I'm in the edit, and, you know, just gearing up for all this whatever comedy stuff. And um, you asked me about, like, the how serious Generator is. And I was telling you, like, the stakes of Generator make it so much funnier than stand-up, which is just supposed to be funny. So we actually, you know, watching that video, like, we actually had the chance with me and Anna Maria to, because no one was hurt, their bodies weren't sacrificed, you know, because in that, what we, what we just watched uh, happened, we were able to laugh at certain details, like, uh, the, the clicking of Jeff Flake's heels as he literally ran away from Anna Maria and uh, Archila and Maria Gallagher. They were running. They had to run up to catch him to talk to them. And we were like, why would this guy run if he knew what he was doing was wrong? He wouldn't run. He would just stroll and then be like, oh, hello. He's running away because he knows I'm going to vote the wrong way oh, and run. And then we're also laughing at that girl being like, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what? They're, they're calling out the person you work for as, like, doing the absolute wrong thing. Like, just this, this soldier of um, misogyny, of white supremacy, this girl. You know, just this, which I, white supremacy, I consider to umbrella it all. But just this soldier, this blank wrote fembot of this message, just going, you know, going with it and not even hearing these women's words, a woman herself. It, it was, it felt good to laugh about it and humanize the little details. Like you had to chase him. Yeah. With the reporters, they had to actually chase him. It was an amazing angle. It was an amazing peek at how she actually did it, how it actually went down. So how important is this Me Too movement to Broad City? And how have you incorporated it and all the actors in it, the kind of conversations you've had? Um, you know, Broad City is uh, birthed by women, and women in this world at this point are kind of all uh, victims of Me Too, or all victims of some some degree of sexual harassment. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> the day you're born as a woman. Um, so the Me Too movement is um, absolutely strengthening Broad City and, and, and emboldening Broad City, our feminist. Uh, we don't even have an agenda, you know what I mean? Like, we were told that we were feminist before we called ourselves feminist, you know, just because we didn't even see it. We were just doing what we 
do in the bodies that we have, you know. But um, interestingly, yesterday, just before you had to cancel the event at the Brooklyn Synagogue because of racist, anti-Semitic graffiti, workers walked out all over the world from Google's— uh, That's right. Headquarters and workspaces everywhere. Google's not very far from us at Democracy Now. Mm -hmm. Massive building. It yes. takes up a whole city block. That's right. Hundreds we'll of people walked out. In fact, I'm going to see if we can get a clip. It's one of the clips that we played um, during our headline. Um, my colleagues, uh, Charina Nadura and John Hamilton, raced out after mm -hmm. Democracy Now to record what people were saying. This is what one of the workers said. Emma Rodriguez of Black Googler Network. Amazing. Apart, she works at Google. Amazing, yeah. And and um, that was so strong of her. That was really cool. It's, um, you know, it, it's important to stand up. And this person, now we're like saying her name. Now we know her face and her voice. It's important that individuals give their stories to create one big voice because the words create action and create change in our culture. Um, and I think you asked about the Me Too movement affecting Broad City. I like worked this out with my therapist. He helped me to see this. Is that like, you know, this is a really, um, th this is a critical moment. We have a, a I, I don't know what the, you know, like boundaries are for me to say, but a proud sexual predator in the White House. I mean, we've heard recordings of his, his pride in sexual assault. We have a proud sexual predator in the White House. And Harvey Weinstein wouldn't have been brought down in a Hillary Clinton presidency. He was doing his thing in the Obama presidency. But us, people who believe in human rights politics, were thanking our lucky stars that we had Obama in the White House. But now that we have a sexual predator in the White House, a racist in the White House, a proud, lifelong racist in the White House, that's why this stuff is coming up. I mean, you had one of your actors um, really revive the Bill Cosby case and that's right. put it into public view again, Hannibal Burris, who plays Lincoln. That's right. Uh, Hannibal was just stating what— um, Tell us the scene, where so it was. Hannibal had been doing this bit for a bunch of months, um, actually, about uh, Bill Cosby, you know, being a hypocrite and actually a— a monster, but um, somebody recorded it at, at one show. You know, I had seen it months before, but somebody recorded it at one show, and it it blew up. And he, Hannibal, really this experience, I think, just rushed through him. It it was interesting to see how um, one person has to take on like a cultural um, disaster, basically. Um, but it like rushed through him and came out the other side. And it took a man to you know people didn't listen to the thirty, forty women who. Um, had uh, accused Bill Cosby of rape and sexual assault. Um, they listened to it when a, a man said it, and a black man, too. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a crazy time. Oh, but something that we've been saying at Generator is, like, this is, like, a giant—white supremacy is a giant, ugly, gnarly pimple that this country was built on, the, the acne, the cancer of this. But this is a chance where we get to— Trump is adding heat. Trump is adding steam. We have the chance to pop this pimple, and we want to do it in the right way. I know it's, like, gross, but it's also funny and true. You can't just cover that up with, a, with concealer. You can't pretend it's not there. It's there. It hurts. It's ugly. But we have the chance to pop that pimple in the right way, to, to do it in the healthy way, where we sit in our discomfort, where we acknowledge the pain, acknowledge the truth, and move forward in a healthy way. This is, you know, even just conversations, American to American, like-minded or not like-minded, is pushing the culture forward. And I'm hearing people talking about it more, uh, about white supremacy and about what's happening in government more and more these days. And there is, um, there is a silver lining. Anna Maria Archila uh, was quoting Valerie Kaur um, in that, uh, in this darkness, this is, I'm paraphrasing, but in this darkness, uh, it is not a tomb, but a womb. And you have to breathe and push, breathe and push through and um, give birth to something 
better and greater. One more time. Um, it is not a tomb, it's a womb. Yes. It, when you are in this darkness and you're sitting and you are trying to locate where your feelings are at, where you are at, and where the greater, the greater community is at, it, is, it, it does not have to be a tomb. It can be a womb. Breathe and push. I want to end where we started, um, at the temple last night, at the synagogue in Brooklyn. Um, there are events that are displayed outside, and it sort of goes through all the different things that are happening. And one of them at Union Temple Synagogue uh, is the Crystal Knocked commemoration for t next week. Um, each year, it says, our congregation marks the anniversary of Crystal Knocked, the night of broken glass, November 10, 1938. This year, we will screen the riveting documentary, The Voyage of the St. Louis. Um, and this is a story of 1939, the St. Louis leaving Nazi Germany with almost a thousand Jews. It first made its way to Havana, Cuba. It was turned away. It then made its way up the coast of the United States. 1939, almost a thousand Jews, and it was turned away in the United States. The Jews were not given refuge, as they then were put out to sea. Um, many of them uh, returned to Europe and Ugh. ended up in concentration camps and died. That's the MS St. Louis story. But it is such a way of bringing together um, Jewish history and migrant history. That's right. It makes me think of David Glosser, the uncle of Stephen Miller, who is the fiercely anti-immigrant senior advisor to President Trump, who went with him to Pittsburgh this past week. Say his name again? Glosser. But Dr. David Glosser lives Glosser. in Philadelphia. And he wrote a piece in Politico. Um, Stephen Miller is an anti-immigrant hypocrite. I should know I'm his uncle. And he calls out his nephew and says, you would not even be alive today. Our families would not have made it if the United States did not accept migrants fleeing persecution. Wow. Sadly, they didn't in 1939. They didn't with um, Anne Frank. Right. Otto Frank applied um, to get his family here. We wow. have to remember this sadly anti-Semitic history of World War II in the United States as well. Is he a, a Jew, Stephen Miller? Stephen Miller is Jewish. Yeah, there, there's Stephen Miller's rabbi during the High Holy Days called him out by name, and then Stephen and then David Glosser, his uncle, wrote this piece. Uh, we interviewed him wow. the day after the slaughter in Pittsburgh because he spends his time now. He's a doctor, a retired doctor, working with refugees, working with Hyas the Jewish refugee wow. agency that has helped to resettle so many thousands of, Jew of Jewish and non-Jewish refugees, um, wow. refugees from around the world. That's what Bowers called out, the gunman who slaughtered the right. Jews in Pittsburgh. He referred to Hyas and talked about the invaders coming in. Quoting President Trump. You know, I, I um, it's, uh, it's just a, a a crazy time. And I think that there's also these, I keep seeing these like Jews for Trump and it makes me so angry as a Jew. And like, you know, this Kanye West stuff is as, you know, I, I was in senior year when his, when college dropout came out. I mean, just devastating, you know, but white supremacy is this disease in this country that can affect anybody can be the host of this disease, you know, and, and Trump is, is, sees that. He, he's just a PR guy. I, I like always say, I was saying in stand-up for a while, and then it stopped being funny, he called himself the blue-collar blue collar billionaire. He just wanted to be on the, on the blue-collar comedy tour. He wanted to be the billionaire on the blue-collar comedy tour. Now he has this actual, actionable power, and it's, he is wielding it so dangerously, doesn't care who dies, children. We've seen Latino children in cages. He, he doesn't care who, and, and in that, you know, I learned on Democracy Now! It was also Latinos who were having to police those children. That's what they do by design. They don't even do the dirty work, these, these Republicans in their offices. And I also just want to say it's a great time for Republicans who disagree with white supremacy to come and speak out and make this not a partisan issue, but a human rights issue. And it's also very <sighs> important what you're saying, that white supremacy can occupy anybody, That's any right. color. That's right. 
Well, I want to thank Alana Glazer for joining us. And if you could end by sharing your thoughts last night as um, you were came to the synagogue um, and you're just getting ready for this big event, hundreds of people are streaming in, how you learned. Uh, you know, um, sort of the information dribbling in my, my about the racist and anti-Semitic graffiti. My co-founder, Glennis Mahar, came in very rattled and nervous, and she's she is very professional. And um, also, she's um, Irish, not Jewish, but it's like a Holocaust studies person there. You know, it was different when it's like, oh, they're they're writing stuff about they weren't writing stuff about Ilana Glazer. They're writing stuff about Jews, you know, but like to my group versus her and you know, her fear and her whatever experience and the bodies we occupy. Um, but Glennis told me and she was she was sort of tempering the information, but she didn't have it either, but um, have it all either. But she had been uh, just found it out from the cops. And then we went out to look at it. And I called you um, to let you know what was happening. And you were like, what does it say? And I was like, you know, actually, I don't know. And you prompted us to go see for ourselves. And um, it was just this bizarre, like, game-time decision mentality of what what are we dealing with here, ideology or physical harm? And that gap is so close now. Th those words become action so quickly these days. And as we ramp up to the midterms, this is President Trump and other Republicans aligning with him. This is your PR. This is your platform. White supremacy, that's it. That's, that's the policy that you— run on. That's how you're getting your followers to act, not canvassing, not playing the game the way the game was set up, but just cheating, just going into a temple or, or a black church and, and shooting up. That's In fact, that story of what happened just before the 11 Jewish worshipers were gunned down, the story in Louisville. That's right. This of two African-Americans. First, uh, this man named Bush um, tried to get into a predominantly black church in Jefferson Town, That's right. right outside Louisville. That's right. He couldn't get in. And so he went to a Kroger supermarket and gunned down an African-American man and woman. And said that whites don't kill whites. And that black church was un unfortunately sharp enough to have secured doors, you know, like that this is uh, how we have the opportunity to worship now. Um, this is the call to action. You know, Generator, I'm a— I, I'm a Democrat. I align with that that party. I'm, I'm trying to get people to act by canvassing, by playing the game the way the game the rules were set up. They're just inciting hate. I mean, it's just cheating. It's just go play another game. That's what I'm saying about Trump. I'm like, go be a comedian if you want to be funny. If you want to stand and rant, and just go be a comedian. Like, it's not it's not the. And if you also want to make a ton of money, like he's in the wrong game, and he's he's uh, just twisting and abusing us as individuals, Americans, but our, our country and our system that, you know, for as broken and gross as it is, for as uh, analogous to a pop a pimple metaphor as it is, um, there's like some pretty good ideas uh, written down that is the way that the country works. And um, he's not heeding any of them. He's really throwing the Constitution in the toilet. So what's next for you? I mean, next, after last night, after having yeah. to cancel this event of hundreds because of the anti-Semitic and some racist uh, scroll on the walls of the synagogue, and this point is so important, if you didn't think there would be physical harm, you would have continued anyway, right? Yes, of course. Of course. Um, but you couldn't know. Right. That's right. And every time we talked about it, we got to a certain point, and I was like, we can't do this, you know? Um, so I'd like to, I'm going to try to make a video today and also send—, send um, uh, your broadcast out to our followers to say what happened and, and point them towards these uh, races, all the races in the local area that I believe in, Perry Gershon's race, Andrew Gunardis, Jim Gorin, uh, Delgado, you know, all these, these local races. Um, but, you know, just finishing up Broad City and getting my next stuff in and line. And what's your next stuff in line? Um, <laughs> uh, well, we're editing for three months, which is fun. And then I, I have, like, a bunch of stuff next year, movies and stand-up and— uh, New stuff, you know, new vibes, familiar vibes. Um, yeah, just lining up 20, 2019 as best I can. Ah. Well, Alana.
Glazer, all the best to you. Thanks um, so much. And thanks so much for coming in this morning. Last night was rough. Uh, Lana Glazer is a comedian, writer and actress, the co-creator and star of the hit Comedy Central show Broad City. Amy Goodman, you're an American hero. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank to you. see part one, uh, thank you, Alana. American to see part hero. one of this discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.